All right, let's go for it. I'm nervous. No, just kidding. <laughs> kind of kidding. And action. I'm nervous. <laughs> I, my name is Jocelyn. I'm here with Larry and Sean, and I'm nervous. <laughs> and I'm a little drunk. Yeah. And he's a little tired. I could use a drink. We've yeah. got nervous, drunk, and tired <laughs> here at Elite Guitars today. I don't like it. Oh, shit, no. That's not how I want to introduce myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're rolling. rolling. We okay. were rolling before, oh so oh. you know that's going to make it on oh, the... Oh, damn. Oh, no. Well, you know, our demographic will enjoy that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's great to be here and to have Jocelyn here. We've we've been, for a while now, for those who are, have been checking out Elite Guitarist, we've always been tweaking the, the jazz track and coming up with some, some new ideas. Of course, when I came on board, Larry had already done so much work to develop this curriculum. And then the discussion has always been how can we add on more instructors, how can we bring more people in, um, not only just for creative and just, it's always, I just love tossing around the teaching ideas with other players, um, just like our playing, everyone has a different take on it. And uh, we, were, we were talking a lot about it and Jocelyn was such a perfect fit for what we're trying to do here at Elite. And so somebody who's bringing a lot of teaching. So yeah, Jocelyn, would, would you love to introduce yourself to the Elite Guitarist family? Yeah. <laughs> well, for starters, thank you for having me and inviting me. And thank you to Tavi, um, who is right there. Um, yeah, my name's Jocelyn. I'm from uh, Winnipeg, Central Canada, a smaller city called Winnipeg. Um, like eight hours or so north of Minneapolis. Um, and, and now I live in Toronto, so uh, Toronto, Canada, and have been playing professionally. Well, I started studying about 11 years ago um, and have been playing professionally for uh, several years and um, yeah also teach up in up in Toronto so yeah thanks for having me on board I'm really uh, it's great having you really here, happy to be here. Yeah. yeah yeah and um, for everyone checking you know, out a lot of our students are always going and listening to recordings and stuff that'd be fun to kind of start off talking about elegant traveler was mm -hmm. a record you did in 2020 is that when it was released yes yep yeah. March 20th 2020. <laughs> so it was a weird week. That was a weird one. So you're the one. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you're the one. Yeah. Yeah. But that yeah, that record is awesome. And, and who, uh, who who recorded with you on that? I did that record on Positone Records, and the band was incredible. It was um, Quincy Davis on drums, who's a former teacher of mine. Um, uh, George Delancey on bass, who is a great New York bass player, originally from Ohio. Um, Addison Fry on piano from Kansas City, originally. Um, uh, and Michael Dees on trombone. Anthony, my friend Anthony Stanko from Detroit on trumpet. So it was kind of like a big hodgepodge just of my, my friends, people who... I've learned a lot from and wanted to play with. That's great. Fantastic. Yeah, have you had um, uh, an opportunity now with things getting back to us, gigging and playing, to kind of get to promote the record and get to do get back to some of the touring that you were that you were planning for when the album was released? Yeah, well, it's actually been um, really interesting. I didn't get to tour the album at all, yeah. um, of course. Um, like never even played the music yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and my next album is coming out in a few weeks oh great cool so Fantastic. have um it's kind of nice i've been able to sort of like just push all these gigs onto into the next next album cycle so yeah. um i'm doing a um for my next album which I haven't even, this is the first time I'm saying, it's called Golden Hour. Cool. Um, it's coming out June 17th, and I'm doing a Cross Canada festival tour. Beautiful. Starting mid-June, so. So is this new album a mix of your own original compositions and a few standards, or how, how did you, what material are you using for this? Yeah, it's yeah. mostly original, 
and I think four, I think six originals, four standards, so actually almost half and half. Beautiful. And it's my first album I, on three tracks sang as well, so did, I am introducing a little bit of singing, which was kind of my first instrument um, before I picked up the guitar. Um, so yeah, six, six originals, a little bit of one track of solo guitar, so just kind of like everything that I love, just yeah. sort of combined into ten tracks. It. That's great, awesome. Well, man, let's. How about we get to some playing today too? We, you know, we were talking before about playing all together or in Paris. So maybe we'll do a little bit of both. I mean, man, Larry, you guys want to want to play a tune to start off? Sure. I would love sure. to. Where do you like this one, Jocelyn? Um, how about more medium? I like it. There we go. Awesome. Um, I guess I'll set it up. Sure. Um, remember to do that. That's right. <laughs> mm.
and learn, coming here to learn. You know, I, I, I always love when I meet new players just hearing about who they've studied with and who's a teacher that impacted them, uh, especially like at a certain point in their life, you know, because we all get to study with eventually so many teachers, but certain times we just meet somebody that really is like a, it's like a nebula explosion in our creative world. So who's a teacher that impacted you? Um, early on with your playing? Yeah, um, well I uh, lived in, in Winnipeg, did my undergrad in Winnipeg, um, and 
then moved to Michigan where I did my uh, master's degree and it was actually Quincy who I was talking about earlier who um, suggested that I move move there. I had originally been planning to move to um, to straight from Canada to New York and I moved to Michigan and studied with uh, Randy Napoleon who's um, kind of now like my big bro we talk all the time and he was really really great as a, a teacher as kind of like a big big brother big sibling on on the instrument he started subbing gigs out to me like kind of right away he sent me sent me out to, with Freddie Cole a few times which was wow. you know just really really great coming from local Winnipeg not having done a ton of touring um, yeah, so we, he's been huge for me. We actually just recorded a, a record together like a month ago. So that'll be my third Ooh. record. Ooh, nice. Um, and yeah, we just talk all the time, play, like he would call. It was cool, a really cool kind of my first real experience with like super tight mentorship, which I feel you two, it oh, seems yeah. like you have. Oh, <laughs> barely. Like... I mean, you know, <laughs> this cat, I don't know. <laughs> as much as I can stand. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. He That's charged me full price. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, I hear you. Yeah. No. He would call me from the airport, be like, yeah. hey, I'm like, yeah, I was just thinking about this thing, like, don't do that anymore. Or like, you know, uh -huh. I tried like, just like, it was kind of really cool how much, yeah, yeah, it wasn't just in, in the lessons. Yeah, Randy's a fantastic player. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed some similarities with your playing, especially your posture of the instrument. Did he right. inform a little bit of your posture? Because it's, it's always interesting, you know, for the classical guitarists who participate in lead guitarist and flamenco, there's such a standardized kind of way of what the posture of the instrument. Mm -hmm. And you watch people with arch tops, I mean, I'm a big guy, I could play a Super 400, no problem, mm -hmm. but playing a 175 feels so small to me. And so certain postures don't really work, and the posture in the middle for me is, it, it, it sometimes will work, but I noticed that's something that Randy did. Did he inform that a little bit in your playing? Definitely, definitely. I hadn't put any thought into, um, like, posture or how to sit or, like, how to even get, like, a sound out of the instrument, um, and that was kind of the first thing we worked on. And also just because, like, I want to, you know, his... Uh, yeah, he was like, if you want to be able to do this for forever, maybe like consider something. Because I was getting a lot of like pain. Some people wow. don't, and that's amazing. But like, I was already starting to feel like I don't know if I can do this for the next, you know, forty years. Um, yeah, yeah. So just, and he's still like all like we were when we recorded this record last week. He was still just like you know too much tension here, too much. Um, yeah, so just sort of trying to, and I tend to like. A little bit get you know I get excited and I get a little bit like Ugh. so just trying to like all the time yeah yeah but, yeah. yeah the guitar will really like string you in like this yeah you know yes. which I think when I was little that's what pulled me into the guitar was it was kind of something I could hold on to but yeah you know realizing like opening up and stuff is such a big part of getting it and it affects your sound in so many ways totally people don't realize that it's not that's not just true. an image thing. I think on the surface level, people are like, oh, you're holding it like this to look formal. And it's like, well, actually, this is a very, very, very practical way. And like the body shape of the guitar. I mean, we're actually, all of us are kind of playing similar sized guitars today. Mm -hmm. um, but like, yeah, the size of the instrument with, at the bottom here can really dictate like where you can actually put it. I mean, some people just can't get the guitar over there or get the neck up like this. It puts this this way. So they, they play more like this inward. You know, you mentioned uh, guitars from your area, like the way Ed Bickert played a Telecaster. You know, he played like this with the shoulder forward, and he played really closely. It's really interesting to see him play like that, you know, on that kind of an instrument. Tiny little guitar. Totally. I've been looking yeah. into Ed a lot since I got to Toronto, just because he's like the yeah. cat yeah. there. Pisano told the, John Pisano told the funniest story about Ed Bickert. Has he uh, told you this story when you picked no. him up at LAX? No. So in the 70s, 80s maybe, Ed Bickert, great jazz guitarist from Canada, he came to LA, and John Pisano, our empresario of the guitar scene, went and picked him up at the airport, and the old school baggage claim at LAX had this long kind of tunnel and this huge chute that came out. They've since taken those out, but and the guitar came flying out of the baggage claim like the flat old school Fender tweed case 
<laughs> flying out and literally just surfed like maybe 10 feet on the linoleum there at LAX, and you know, it's chaos, it's LAX even back then. And Pisano, like you said, he just about had a heart attack. He looked over at Ed, and Ed looked at him and said, hey, it's a Fender, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, that Telecaster, that's a real like 58 Telecaster that he's playing. That guitar's worth, you know, it's worth a Tesla or two now. Yeah. But it's funny, it's just, you know, Ed, Ed, a lot of old guys had their philosophy about gear that way. Every, you know, they're just like, oh, it's yeah. just, I just, this is just what I play, you know, mm -hmm. so yeah, we don't yeah, worry yeah. so much about mm -hmm. about that, but yeah. 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 It's a solid piece of wood, too, so it'd probably yeah. be okay. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. And he just yeah. put it back, and the guitar literally popped out of the case and hit the floor. He just put the guitar back in the case. He's like, ah, oh, it's okay. It's a Fender. Well, uh, you and Jocelyn are going to play something. Is yeah. That correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Before you play something, I have a, a question for you, Jocelyn. Yeah. I want to know about your earliest experiences with music. What 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 sort of influenced you and took you in a certain direction from the earliest moment in, that you yeah. can remember? Yes. Um, yeah. Well, um, my dad, for his career, was he's retired now, but he was an elementary music teacher. Uh -huh. So. Um, I grew up and my mom was a hobbyist guitar player um, and my dad also was a hobbyist guitar player so I grew up hearing a lot of a lot of music my mom loved to sing she always kind of like just my whole childhood is just like her kind of playing and singing and so I think from like apparently before I could talk I was singing and just um, kind of really really ha like developed a strong relationship to music from a really young age mm. um so my earliest memories some of them are just i mean just like singing all the time um but i specifically remember when i was about maybe like four my dad at his school put on a uh the wizard of oz oh. and he used to tell me that he needed my help he would accompany the the musicals, so he used to tell me he needed my, he needed my help to practice. Like he couldn't do it without me, so it was really important for me to learn the songs and sing them, so that he could accompany, so he could practice right. accompanying. Right. So I took this very dutifully and memorized the entire Wizard of Oz, like still know it in and out, and still know the vert like mm -hmm. which. Like, so for some reason I know the verse, it was like the sheet music, so not the, the mm -hmm. movie. They don't include the verse to Over the Rainbow in the movie, but I just know that verse really intimately from that. Um, so yeah, one of my earliest memories is like learning The Wizard of Oz. And I'm like, Dad, we have to practice! <laughs> and is there a specific artist that sort of put you on a, on a trajectory at some point? Um, that you heard a, a, a specific recording or a live experience? That's a great question. I, hmm, well, I didn't start studying, uh, studying until guitar until I, like, formally until I was 19 and just started, like, discovering jazz. I was okay, older. Interesting. So, um, but definitely Wes would have been like in, in right. my introduction, somebody gave me smoking at the half note and I, you know, just listened to it on repeat for a year and got totally hooked. Yeah, that, that's a seminal recording for me too. Uh, so, oh, wow. And you, I can hear the influence definitely. You have this beautiful <sighs> sense of swing, you know, oh. deep time feel. So one other really quick question. How does the voice affect your decision making on the guitar? Do you, do you find that there's a lot of sort of overlap between the two? John's got this, uh, uh, is a very gifted singer as well. Oh, so, oh uh, cool. He could answer that. Only in, only in the country western scene. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. Um, yes. Well, I think it's not a coincidence that this is like sort of the singing range. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. um, 100%. Yeah. And I think I tend to like even gravitate towards the areas of the neck that like my singing voice feels comfortable in. Do you find that as well? Totally. In fact, I'm a high tenor, so my lowest note I can sing is that, is the low E. So for me, playing in the middle right here, it just it's so easy. It's just once you get up higher into the, once I'm up in the head voice, if I'm actually like singing what I'm playing, it can get a little little funky. But yeah, it, it, yeah the guitar and the voice, I tell you, it, it's, it, 
really shows you that deep origin thousands of years ago that it really does really does go together even back to the lute and you know all of that it's all related to playing with accompanying a voice totally yeah. definitely i think it's almost like the things i wish i could sing i can just play uh -huh. the guitar you know sure. like um, yeah. yeah yeah because yeah i think they're super connected Mm -hmm. And I try to always get my students to sing as yeah. much as possible yeah, too. as well. And you can always tell when you hear, like, you can usually tell. Like, it doesn't surprise me that you yeah. sing, you know? Well, yeah, or even trying to get students, you know, to sing in a group setting versus in a one-on-one -on -one setting, you know? There's different different comfort levels there, and you kind of break that mold. And yeah. But, yeah, so students, I think students can be surprised early on how much they actually can sing if they really apply it and really think about it and don't focus on the syllables, don't worry if your pitch is a little out. You know, pitch is something that can be fine-tuned, but actually singing where you're at, you know, kind of making that connection. Mm -hmm, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's deep for us guitarists on this instrument, especially. Definitely, you know. definitely. Do you yeah. sing also? I do. I like to sing. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a singer. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out in public like you and John could. <laughs> But I, I I use singing all the time as a model with my students yeah. because really the human voice is the most expressive instrument. You know, yeah. you've got the consonants and you've got the vowels, and you've got a way of shaping a line that on guitar is very difficult to emulate. You know, I, I often talk about the Delta blues players because yeah. their model is voice from the get go. Yeah. You know, and when you have that, when you have that quality, the mechanics disappear. Becomes about expression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I used to love when Larry would teach in class. There would be certain concepts that, of course, you demonstrate as a virtuosic guitarist so perfectly on the guitar. But then, just to show the concept another way, and oftentimes in the improv class, you would sing what you were doing, or you would you would you would relate pulse right. back to singing to the guitar playing, and like trade fours with yourself and. Boy, as a student, it's so cool. It, it, I was so blown away by that, Larry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, I think you have a great voice. You got an awesome voice. Thank you. Jerry's Thank in. You, you have an awesome go. voice. Mel Torme, everybody. It's not Mel Torme today. It's not <laughs> debuting today. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh boy. Well, should we play another one here? Yeah. Let's. Yeah. Do it. Let's see. So let's do. Uh, it's all right with me. Let's do it. Who wrote this? Cole Porter. Is it Cole Porter too? All right, let me make sure I got my volume up. Always have your volume up when you play guitar, oh, everybody. Mine. That's tip one of the day. <laughs> cool, where do you want to do it at? Um, sure, yeah. yeah. You want to take it? Sure. Maybe right on it. Sure, yeah, one, that sounds great. Two, one, two, uh, uh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>
tune too if we want for the live stream people if you're watching on instagram there is no live stream oh there is no live stream oh i thought there was we're doing it on (laughs) we are live streaming on instagram oh Oh, we are yeah yeah. we are perfect yeah oh can i take back no (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) (laughs) all right yeah well we could do another one too for the for the Mm -hmm. live stream people and if the take is better how's my level now if i'm like right there there. Good. <laughs> that look on your face is very telling. Ah! <laughs> well, you like That's it. You good. like it. You want more. Okay. <laughs> John, less is more. Less is more. Like makeup. <laughs> less polish more. Less polish more. Yes. <laughs> L5 is less. Polish is more. <laughs> no, less is less. Yeah. Less is less. Yeah. Really. Yeah. We're losing Instagram yeah, watchers. Yeah. One at a time. Falling off the radar. Yeah. Yeah, well, we can do. Why don't we do We actually did. We had 15 people and it went down to three. Yeah. (laughs) And it's my mom and my aunt Jane. Yeah. And And that lady that comes to all the shows. (laughs) (laughs) Stalker. Yeah. 
It's almost better to play something else, right? Yeah, yeah let's yeah. do yeah, let's do something else. Um, um, you want to do that? Mm-hmm. Thank you. 
together. Feels good to play some duo. Yeah. 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 What's um, you know, maybe kind of as we're sort of winding down and, and keep as we're talking more interview stuff. Mm -hmm. What's something that when you first meet a student, especially like an advanced student, what? It, this is a tough question, and sometimes people can answer it, sometimes people can't. I'm mm -hmm. always curious. I asked you this question once. It's like, what's one of the first things that you find is a common ground assessment? For someone who's, again, an, a player who's been playing, somebody coming to you at more of an advanced level, mm -hmm. is there something that always right of way seems to strike you that you assess, like, okay, this student, they're they're at this point with this in their journey? And yeah. I'm always curious. Yes, always for me, I think, just time. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah. Yeah. because language is, like, or like what you're playing on, for me, it's like we'll have two completely different sets of what we play and what we like to play and how we think of harmony, but time is so universal and it's either yeah. you're either you know playing with good time or not and I find that often it's like the hardest thing for me anyway it's the hardest thing so yeah. it's so easy to talk about I think yeah yeah do you feel that there's things that you do that you hint at to students about their time feel when you're teaching them versus because again it, it is it's such an abstract concept and how do we teach people to feel their inner pulse I mean it's that is one of the great questions as a music teacher I think it's easier to teach them pitch, it's easier to teach them rhythm, it's easier to teach them the tangibles of what music is, but to teach them to feel their inner pulse mm -hmm. is something that is a journey everyone has to kind of go Sorry. on, you know, and I, my, me too, my mom was a music teacher, she taught music 35 years, and because we had so much music on in the house, and everything had a beat to it, everything, had, I, I always felt like my time feel was something that was there, mm -hmm. and it wasn't until I was in high school, it's like, oh wow, some people struggle with this, and they need to use a metronome first or to hear the time and um, so I'm curious, yeah are there things that you hint at with mm. students when you play to, to help them understand that's something that needs to be worked on yeah I think um, for me like we'll listen to an exercise that I like to do we'll listen to we'll record a student playing just completely on their own and then listen back and say like can you clap like can you tap your foot along like can you um does this make sense because often it'll, it might make sense in your head but it's not coming across right. and you'll hear all the beats dropped and you'll yeah. hear you'll hear everything and another just sort of like something that was told to me by one of my teachers that um i just sort of try and keep in mind all the time is that like it's it's our job to swing the band too. Like time is as much, it doesn't matter what instrument you play, time is just as much your responsibility as any, anything 
as anybody's, like just as much as the drummers and just as much as the bass players. You can swing That's right. swing the band and you listen to like, for me it's like I'll often play Grant or Wes and say like, you hear how much they're, like they are the time and at any time anybody should be able to listen to you and fit into your time instead of, I think sometimes as soloists, we tend to think the other way around. It's their job to drag us along, but that's not true. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also, I'm, yeah. And, and along those lines too, like Larry, it's, is there anything new that you've been exploring with teaching about time feel at all? Or have you had any recent epiphanies? I mean, yeah, about uh, I'm, it? I'm using a lot of uh, free improvisation mm. lately to teach about time so that students can sort of focus in on shaping and feeling time deeply without having to adhere to a progression. Mm -hmm. You know, because that in and of itself, to tell a story above a whole progression, play a solo, which is developmental in nature, right? You start with one idea and you build on it. That's a tall order in and of itself, right? Just organizing pitch material. So yeah. if you're free of having to play a specific pitch, you can really put all your mental energy into time and feel. That's and, interesting. You know, because you know, time is an interesting. It's an interesting concept because it's it's not just one thing. It's not just placement. Right. It's much more than placement. Right. Right. Yeah. It's because people. You know, I, I saw this this video where Pat Metheny played behind the beat oh, man, that's and a, ahead of the beat, and they all work. Yeah. Right. So it's not just. There's no perfect placement. So feel and sound and shaping has a lot to do with it, you know. I think. I, yeah. So cool. Yeah, and, and you know, we get into this with our with the instruction on lead guitarists because there is a common theme to all the videos, and it's that we really try to. I mean, at least one of my goals when I'm teaching for a lead guitarist is to demonstrate how everything, whether you're playing a major scale in quarter notes or you're playing something like you're working on complicated chord forms. Everything should really be assigned a time, especially at a certain point you're practicing. When we get things off the ground, we're just getting the fingers down or trying to learn where to put the fingers, and then we figure out how to make those changes, and then right away it's like, okay, I can do it here. And the more we assign time and tempo to everything that we practice, the more that we're building that muscle. But, yeah, it's just, that's... It is true. Time feel. I asked a guitarist once about that, and he said sound. You know, it's like because so many students will just plug right in and just start playing, and they might be playing a guitar that's got two pickups, and both pickups are on, and and they're not, or their picking is really light, or they're digging in too hard one way or the other, and and th this this guitar educator. Uh, who remained nameless, a great, great guitarist who we all know. But he, he, yeah, sound is the first thing, even before time, which is just interesting. But I agree with you guys. Time, time, because sound is something that uh, is a part of that and a part of that awareness. I agree. But um, students sometimes can have a sense of their own time feel, and it's not right. It's it's just it's always rushed or it's always dragged or there's yeah. some or there's some sort of warpedness to it, and but they're feeling their pulse. So, I, I remember there was a, a chapter in my life where I was doing a lot of pops gigs, so we yeah. would play with the symphony orchestras, and I was always sort of a keen student of watching how you know cellists would warm up or how you know an oboist would warm up, and inevitably they'd all play long tones mm -hmm. and get into sound, you know, mm -hmm. and just sort of and that really impacted me. I thought, you know. Uh, when you live in that space, things open up. When the sound is where, I don't know how, if you've had this experience, Jocelyn or John, yeah. where the sound is right and you're, all of a sudden the nervous system is open and stuff comes out. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're in a, in a position where the sound isn't right and it's like, I, I can't play. Yeah. yeah. You feel yeah. like you're choked. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. It's tough. This instrument, I mean, the arch, we're arch top players. And mm. I tell you, it's, it, in a way, I understand why it's a bit of a dying thing for a lot. Like, there's some great young players playing arch tops, but semi hollows, solid bodies. Wow become kind of the thing and it's really hard in a variety of situations to get good sound just naturally out of the arch top you have to have a really solid concept of what you're doing and you know if you're playing Sorry. it's hard it's rare i mean some of us that play loud venues with arch tops i find that in a lot of cases with a twin reverb and i'm just like okay here we go i've got to figure out how to get a warm beautiful sound way out there that's right yeah, yeah. and it's hard yeah. so having that that concept is yeah. is square one right mm -hmm. yeah yeah interesting well 
I, I know we're kind of winding down here a little bit. Maybe we should play our, we're going we're gonna to do one last tune, mm. all three of us, this uh, Milt Jackson tune. You guys up for that? Absolutely. Sounds fun. Sound yeah. Oh, let's do it. <laughs> well. <laughs> Can I come in the shop and ask a question? Yes. Uh, yes. Just one, though. The top G, one. G is this. <laughs> it's first finger, second finger. <laughs> finger. Is that oh, the question okay. you were going to ask? Yeah, it's hard. Okay. 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 I'm still working on my E chord, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, take, take it easy on me. <laughs> yeah. I see you guys playing. I hear you play, and uh, there seems to be such joy. Mm. Where does the joy come from? Because... There are other genres of music, like flamenco music, you see the anguish, the, the pain, mm. right? In classical music, you see kind of a certain mm. ethos that goes with that too. There is emotion, there is expression, mm. perhaps not joy. So where does the joy in playing, is it from the improvisational nature of music, from the, the fact that you are playing together and you are discovering? The, I, I, it's just a, a question. It's it's a fantastic question. Should we go down the line or sure? Yeah, yeah you want to go right. first. Line? So, um, uh, Tavi, it's it's a great observation. I you know, uh, first of all, first and foremost, I I try to with my students instill that the the that there should always be joy present when you play. It affects time, it affects sound, yes. it affects everything. It connects you to the experience because basically it is an internal experience. I mean, there's external, there's, we're taking in things, but it, we're processing it from the inside out. And, um, you know, when I, look at, when I look at dance troops, I think about, you know, um, the fact that they're sort of, dancing a choreographed dance, maybe they've, they've, they've danced this dance hundreds of times, but they're feeling the play of gravity, you know, when they jump, leap in the air, and the freedom that they feel for a moment, mm -hmm. and feeling in sync with time, feeling that groove. There's just something that is dance-like about what we do. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's physical. There's a joy just in a shared sense of time, feeling that journey together. Anyway, that's my take. I like that. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Jocelyn, what do you think? Um, yeah, I, I, that's, that kind of really resonated with me. Um, I think the just feeling, it feels like a celebration and your chance to express yourself. And I think that that's just really um, beautiful. And also just so, it makes me feel so, uh, just connected to like hum human, like we all just met, Yeah. you know, like I just met everybody in this room that's a half right. hour ago, yeah. an hour ago, and we've already played music together. And I just think that that's, you know, with everything, like I drove past like five Amazons to get here and just like, <laughs> this is what is like beautiful about humans, yeah. despite everything that's going on in the world, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's, I don't, I never thought much about that in the contrast to the flamenco and the classical world, you know. Um, uh, but for me, it's like, when I play this music, I feel like I belong here, even though I'm in process with this, I will always be a student of this music. Um, I'm in process, but it's, it's a contrast to all the other times in my life where I didn't feel like I belonged there. And I, you know, it's one of the joys of being a musician is you get to be in a community with other people who are right alongside you in the same area and that brings you a lot of joy so in contrast to like me being at like i don't know in my physical education class in fourth grade i did not belong in that class you know like, <laughs> i was not the first pick for kickball but then when it comes to something like this like ah oh, yeah this is this is the hang this is this is worse so yeah it just naturally it just feels so great to do that and i one of the one of the my favorite things of being a musician is tra showing the audience that that's how I feel about the music, and not in an egotistical way, just like showing them that I am happy about this, and mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah, so it's that's interesting to pick up on that. We'll see how joyful I am after I solo on this D flat blues. <laughs> I, I, I love that, that you had that question though, Tommy, because I think that's that's actually central to it all. 
really, really. Mm-hmm. Waking up every day, feeling grateful for doing this, and feeling the connection that you can have with this instrument, which yeah. can amplify what's internal. You know, I love it. It's, yeah, man. It is joy. It's joyful. Yeah, and for students that don't haven't felt that yet because they're just trying to, like, figure things out, that comes. That will come. You will be able to. Mm-hmm. You will be able to get there. Yeah. Good, good words of wisdom, Larry. We've got a tune today called SKJ, which I can't remember what those letters stand for, but it's Milt Jackson's wife, the great vibraphonist, and this is from an album, Bags Meets West, and it's a D-flat blues. Bonus points if you can tell us how many flats are in the key of D-flat. That's a lot of flats. <laughs> a lot of flats. <laughs> oh, and remember, don't be flat, don't be sharp, just be natural. Aww. Aww. I love that. A little twinkle at the end there. Yeah, that one's free. You don't have to subscribe to that joke. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Right there. One. Thank you. 
Let's hear it, Coots. Thank you guys.